problems of your war, climate change. And if this is true, then this raises the question of how Taoists come to help, can help avert this danger. And what it is specifically that Taoism can contribute to a solution. Now, as a philosopher, what I'm interested in are little puzzles, little problems. And one thing I noticed is that Tao Ziao was very, very useful, very, very helpful in the last century, maybe 1980, when it came to the solution of environmental problems. Because at that time, environmental problems were mostly caused by people doing too much to nature. And so a solution for environmental problems could largely consist in doing less. So the Taoist notion of Wu Wei, non-action, was very useful for environmentalism in the 20th century. But climate change changes the situation. Suddenly, we find ourselves in a situation where the natural system has become sick. It has become destabilized. And if at that point we do nothing, it will get worse. So Taoism has a little bit of a problem. It was useful for environmentalism in the last in the 20th century. But it must somehow be reinterpreted or rethought in some ways to remain useful for environmentalism in the 21st century. Specifically, this would mean, specifically this would mean um, how can we read Wu Wei so that it allows not so much for non-action, but for action. Not so much for standing back, but for moving in. Not so much for passivity, but for interference and intervention. That way, I think, one could remain in harmony with Hansen Lau and the mission that Tao Ziao and Tian Di Ziao can help with the great problems in this century. Okay, now having said that, allow me to go back and make a second remark before starting the PowerPoint. Regarding nuclear war and climate change, how do these two compare? Well, for one thing, climate change and nuclear war um, bad. They're all bad. They're universal harms. When they happen, everybody will be harmed. Nobody will be benefited. But with this, the similarities end. Because nuclear war is possible, but not actual. Climate change is already actual, not only possible. Nuclear war, if it happened, would happen abruptly, suddenly. Climate change happens slowly and continues. Nuclear war, if it happened, would happen dramatically. Climate change happening is happening very inconspicuous. Nuclear war, if it happened, would happen in a very, well, interesting way. It would focus our attention. It would blow all other news away. Climate change, as it is happening, 
happens in a very boring way, in a dull way. It's a bit like paying attention to the news of climate change. It's a little bit like watching a wall that has been painted with fresh paint and then watching the paint dry. Nothing really happens much. And that makes it more dangerous. The last difference is that climate change, or rather, let me see, um, climate change is something that is predictable. Well, this nuclear war is unpredictable. If nuclear war happened, it would happen randomly. It would come out of nowhere. Like, we would not know the month or the year before if it happened, that it would happen. But climate change is perfectly predictable. It's perfectly to be expected. We know what we are doing through nature. Nature is acting according to its own lawfulness. And these laws of nature cannot be negotiated with. The more CO2 you add to the atmosphere, the more global warming you cause. The more global warming you cause, the higher the average global surface temperatures will go up. The higher these temperatures will go up, the more problems we will have. So it's very critical. To conclude this initial statement, I want also to remind you of one final point of Culture between these two problems, <coughs> nuclear war and climate change. As I said before, both are universal problems. Both are all bad. But climate change, in addition, is also an opportunity because it necessitates a new way of thinking. It necessitates a cultural evolution. Now, Livia, Professor Kohn, in her talk about Chuanzi and perfect happiness, um, showed a slide where Chuanzi uh, uh, was giving suggestions of how to solve the problem of anxiety and the problem of stress. And that particular slide had to do with the work of uh, Robert Santilla. And here is one way of how you can see the opportunity of solving climate change. We are, as a civilization, producing climate change because we are all, in a sense, in a stress mode as a civilization. The solution is in a way to move to a new cultural paradigm where we come from a stress mode to a flow mode, to from a distress mode to a use stress mode, to use your words. So in that sense, Chuanzi is relevant not only for the inside, like internal psychology, but also for the outside, for culture, for world culture for global civilization, for the environment. So having said that, let me begin. So the title of my paper is uh, The Tao of Geoengineering. And that raises as the first question, why geoengineering? Why do I want to talk about geoengineering in 2013 and not in 2053? Um, the related question is, well, what actually is happening with climate change? What is the status of climate change in 2013? Next to what does that mean? Uh, or uh, how is climate change now? There's also a related question, namely, what does it mean? What does this mean for human existence and for life? Now, the Tao of geoengineering relates climate change to culture, 
the East Taoists, the Tao Tiao, is a phenomenon of culture. It's not a phenomenon of science. So, is it not the case that climate change is a problem for scientists and for engineers? So, why culture? That is what I'd be next question then to explore. And then, in culture, why Taoists? And here, can we find or articulate a Taoist account, a Taoist ethics of geoengineering? And what would that mean? So these are the three questions that uh, I would like to consider in the next 15 minutes. Okay, so if we think of climate change then and now, so the first question like, what is the status of climate change? Uh, then we can as well like go back in time, right? 2013, 10 years ago, 2003, 10 years ago, 1993. So 20 years ago, in 1993, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was at 355 parts per million. Uh, and that already was more than it was in 1950, where it was 310 parts per million. You can think of the concentration of CO2 like the control of an AC unit. Right? That is like the more of this concentration you put in, the more you change the temperature. At that time, well, now a bit um, At that time, the first signs were happening 20 years ago that the North Pole sea ice start to thin and to thaw. Huh? I mean, the sea ice goes oscillation, so it's more in the late spring, and then it is less in fall, and then it goes up like that. So it's always more and less, more and more. But suddenly, the peak, the annual peak of the sea ice in spring was less than it was. And the annual low in fall was, was even lower than before. So it had started to happen. Now, another thing that happened was that the ocean started to warm up, and the surface temperature of the ocean controls the monsoon. And the monsoon, the wind that just comes to India, and to Bangladesh, and also then to the Horn of Africa, uh, controls the rainfall. And so as the ocean temperature in the Indian Ocean was warming up, the monsoon became irregular. It still comes but not as regular anymore. And the result was that in the area of African northwestern corner of Africa, the country of Sudan and Somalia and the region of Darfur, no more rainfall. And you, rem you all remember the news in Darfur in the past 10 years of this great humanitarian catastrophe that this society that consisted of farmers and of herders were simply running out of good land for their cattle and for good land for their field. Suddenly there was not enough land to feed both farmers and ranchers anymore. The farmers were sedentary, they were just living in one place, and the ranchers were just moving through. So these two cultures had been in harmony and in peace for millennia. But when the rain stopped, they started to kill each other. They had to, because there was simply not enough land to, to feed both groups. So one group tried to kill the other group, and the other group tried to kill the first group, so as to reduce the population, so as to feed their children. The catastrophe of the In 2003, the level of CO2 had risen even further. The Arctic now kept speeding up. And then the next news happened that in Australia, a big drought came. And after the drought disappeared, another drought. And then a year or two, it was better again, and another drought. And so Australia is becoming more and more over the decades like the Sahara in Africa. Also, coral reefs around the world started to become stressed. I remember maybe 10 years ago or five years ago, uh, the coral reefs in south of uh, Taiwan, at uh, Kanting, started to make news because marine biologists said 
Look at the corals in PMT. They're like maybe the only ones that are still healthy. So think of this, that suddenly healthy corals make news. Sick corals don't make news anymore because corals around the world are sick. Also, when CO2 gets in the atmosphere, the oceans, the oceans take it down again. And as the oceans take down the CO2 from the atmosphere, they become acidificated. They may become sour. So marine acidification begins to happen. When the pH value of the seawater changes towards the acidic level, then it starts to attack the shells of mussels and seashells and crustaceans. So this is another ticking time bomb because the little clams and shells that are in the ocean are the bottom of the food chain. If they disappear, the oceans will become empty. There will be no more fish. Now in this year, just last week, we crossed the threshold to 400 parts per million. The Arctic has already lost half of its sea ice of 20 years ago. The corals are now dying. Uh, and now new things are happening, such as the Amazon rainforest is becoming stressed and is showing signs of long-term change. So some scientists worry that the jungle of the rainforest will transform into a savanna, like you have in Kenya. Amphibians, salamanders, frogs, toads, are beginning to disappear because somehow this group of animals is particularly sensitive to the changes that are happening now. Also, two months ago, the first news uh, in the science journals was that the oceans had become so sour that they start to affect now shellfish. So the first species of shellfish already showed now signs of damage to marine acidification. And the South Pole, Antarctica, which until last year had been stable, now also shows signs of beginning to melt. That is the status of climate change then now. Now, at the same time, we can see a certain progress uh, in the sciences. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, produces the assessment reports every five years about climate change. The last one was the fourth assessment report of the 4, 2007. The fifth assessment report is going to come out in a few months. The third assessment report was in 2001. The ARs of the IPCC are today the largest collaboration of scientists around the world. In the history of humankind, there never has been this kind of scientific joint venture as with the assessment reports, because it's the attempt to synthesize all the information we have from so many different disciplines, ranging from geology to physics to biology to meteorology, into one predictable uh, scenario uh, set that tells us how climate change is going to unfold. The second remarkable feature about the IPCC is not only the size, the sheer number of the scientists who are involved in that, but also that scientific progress has changed, that it used to be that science tells us about the past, like dinosaurs, and about the present. But now science can tell us about the future. And with the exception of Newtonian mechanics, where you basically can predict the emotions of the planets um, on, in the solar system, we did not have this capacity yet. So you remember from uh, last night's uh, second talk by uh, Professor Young, um, that he was giving the slide on clairvoyance. And clairvoyance, the ability to see the future, is now becoming a scientific enterprise. Now, in these scenarios, 
of seeing the future. There are there's a fan of probabilities, a cone of probabilities. And there is over like two types of scenarios: a best case scenario and a worst case scenario. In the best case scenario, we would see basically a sharp drop in greenhouse gas emissions. And in the worst case scenario, you would see a continued rise in greenhouse gas emissions. Greenhouse gases are these that include CO2, carbon dioxide. If suddenly all the GHG emissions will drop, world temperatures will still be 1.8 degrees higher in 2001, 2100 than they were in the year 2000. On the other hand, if the emissions keep on going up, then the global mean surface temperature in 2100 will be 3.4 degrees higher than it was in the year 2000. So these were the scenarios that the IPCC developed in the year 2000 and then went into the car and into the AR4 report. However, now it is like 2013, and in contrast to the scenarios, we already have the actual data of the emissions from 2000, 2001, up to the year 2012. And it turns out that the actual emissions of the global economy are in excess of the emissions predicted in the worst case scenario of 2000. So we actually have more than in the A2 scenario, and that puts our temperature range up to five degrees higher by the end of the century than it will be by the beginning. And that brings us to sort of like the second part of this empirical question, and we saw that, what does this mean? Well, if you have this kind of like climate reality track of our current emissions that like bring us to like four to five degrees higher temperatures, then first of all, the corals will simply disappear. That beautiful picture that Livia showed of the happy fish, no more. Of the coastal wetlands, 30% will disappear. The National Health Services will be strained because you have illnesses that are in the tropics moving out of the tropics into subtropical zones. For example, in Florida, where I teach, we already have now the first cases of dengue fever, which used to be uh, an illness that was maybe like in Cuba or Costa Rica or Venezuela, but now it's moving up to Florida. It's similar for Taiwan. We can expect that these that health problems that are traditional for the Philippines will affect Taiwan. So malaria will come back. Dengue fever will come back. All these are like illnesses that are related to tropical mosquitoes that can simply fly and infect people will come back. Global economic losses are predicted about 5% of GDP in the world countries. Not only will the North Polar ice be gone and the uh, outside of Antarctica, but like the interior ice of Greenland and Antarctica will also start to melt. Now, sea level, we don't know. The linear sea level rise is like sometime after 2100, it will be between 5 and 11 meters. This is something we can still handle. I right? just built Paris. Uh, my university, University of South Florida, is five meters above sea level. So will it still be there? I don't know. But then there's also the probability of non-linear changes, um, which would happen if, when you think of Antarctica, the ice on top of Antarctica that sits outside the ocean rips, and then that ice shield could slide into the ocean, lifting up the ocean water rather suddenly. If that happens, then the rise would be 65 meters. But whether it happens, when it happens, if at all, we don't know. Now, what does this mean for humans, for culture? Well, greater social stratification. There will be more poor people. There will be more famines. There will continue to be also very rich people. But normal people, middle class people, will have a harder time. Middle class people will either get rich, if they're lucky, 
or they will get poor, which will be more normal. There will be a loss of quality of life, not because of well, you know, obvious reasons. If you have to fight with fevers and fungus, not so good. The standards of living will go down because it simply puts stress, uh, strain on the GDP. And maybe most importantly of all these bad news, we have to deal with food insecurity. The climate change will transform our Earth from a blue-green planet into a blue-yellow planet. It will be much harder for farmers to grow food. Food will become more expensive. And as the world population keeps growing, it will be more difficult for the individual human on the planet to simply feed the family and feed the children. That, I think, is the ultimate meaning of climate change. We are not safe when it comes to food. And with this lack of safety, other things will happen. People will leave regions that don't feed them anymore. In Darfur, you may have war. Okay, what are the strategies? So what can we do? Well, basically, one, the most obvious thing is you attack it at the cause. So, this is called mitigation. Reduce the emissions and move to a post-carbon economy. Now, mitigation is already happening. So the good news is these strategies are already in place and they are already, as of a life, working. Germany, for example, decided in 2010 for a so-called Energiewende. That's a German word, it means energy term. Uh, they, they decided that they moved towards a post-carbon economy. They created, in 2011, the legislative apparatus or the laws to make that possible. And 2012 started to shift Germany's economy to rely increasingly on solar power and wind power. In 2012, already up to 30% of the energy in Germany was produced by solar and wind alone. Peak capacities, peak capacities of the energy was 70%. And they expect to be 100% free of fossil fuels by 24. In Taiwan, unfortunately, as in Florida, unfortunately, this is not happening. Right? Florida is known as the sunshine state, but there are no solar collectors. Taiwan has beautiful sunshine, but there are no solar collectors. Why? I don't know, but I don't like it. Adaptation is how to deal with the effects. That will simply mean to harden the infrastructure. Harden the infrastructure on all levels. Uh, you see that, uh, for example, in Taiwan, when we think of the effects of Taiwan uh, uh, typhoon water cut, uh, that hit the south of Taiwan two years ago very hard. And you see what it did, for example, to the road that connects Tainan to Taidong in Nanhengonglu. At the Nanhengonglu, all the bridges were washed out, and up to this up to today, I believe, we cannot go up to Yako and go back down again. We're still working on the reconstruction. So make our roads better, make our houses better, build uh, dikes, make stronger water systems, make stronger electricity system, build more clinics for people who get hurt. That's adaptation. And then finally, geoengineering. And geoengineering deals with the event itself. Not just the cause and the effects, but actually what is happening. Now here, there are basically two or three ways of dealing with this. One is just to suck the carbon out of the air, carbon capture, as you get rid of the CO2. The easy way would be plant trees. Another way would be build carbon scrubs. These are little machines that have already been invented, and they just need to be mass produced. They a hundred thousand, a million, ten million, a billion of them, put them everywhere, and let them draw the carbon out. So we have the technology to do that. The other is to raising our needle, like to simply create more white surfaces than dark surfaces on the planet, so as to re make the sunlight reflect better. And then finally, 
to do some such thing as the uh, manage the incoming sunshine itself. Basically, to make an umbrella between here and the sun. Um, that is not quite possible, or to the extent it is possible, with current technological means, it would be extraordinarily expensive. However, carbon capture and raising our needle is within our technological means. And so, in terms of the strategies then, we have the mitigation, adaptation, and geoengineering. And the interesting thing about this is that it is already being done in some ways, and it can be done in others that haven't been uh, explored yet. So, then, if you think of the problem, and you think of the solution, then my question, and that's perhaps like the essential question of this talk here, is where is the problem located? What is the area of the problem? Where is the root of the climate problem? And the interesting thing is that a closer look shows us something different than what a first glance would tell us. At first glance, climate change looks like a problem for scientists. And mitigation, adaptation, and uh, geoengineering looks like a problem for engineers, for technology. But think about this. In scientific terms, climate change is not a basic problem anymore. Scientists at the IPCC only now deal with the details. And scientifically, we understand what is the cause. Scientifically, we understand what is the effect. And scientifically, we understand what is in between, the event in between. So it is not a basic scientific problem. It is also not a basic engineering problem because we can, if we wanted to, turn all the global economy over to post-carbon energy sources. The technology can still be improved, but the technology is already there. Likewise, in terms of mitigation, when you think of like, building these carbon scrubber, these carbon washing machines to suck CO2 out of the air, we have it already invented, it just needs to be built. But we don't know. So, it's not a scientific problem. It's not a technological problem. The scientists have done their job. The engineers have done their job. And when you think of it in terms of ethics, environmental ethics, climate ethics, philosophy of law, the ethicists also have already given us answers. We know climate change is bad. We know there will be no or very few beneficiaries of it. We also know that it will be create injustice in the world. And we also know what would be the just and fair strategies for burden sharing in the world, in the global community, to address this problem. So we already have answers from ethicists too. And that leaves as the final area where the root of the climate problem is located, culture. But when you think of that kind of like culture, like how we live, how our being in the world, like the Heideggerian term, uh, uh, is, is fashion, then which culture is responsible for it? And it turns out that, well, we can make differentiations. It's not culture per se, but some cultures are more responsible than others. For example, the rich countries are more responsible for the problem than the poor countries. The rich countries have started climate change, the poor countries have not. But among the rich countries, there's also a difference. Japan is rich, America is rich, but Japan is not really responsible for climate change in per capita cumulative terms, but the United States is the greatest producer of CO2 in per capita and in cumulative terms in the world. So it turns out it's a problem, when you think of East and West, of the West. Western culture has created this problem. But then again, what Western culture, right? I mean, you have Europe, 
and you have America, you have in Germany the attempt to already move to an energy, uh, uh, a new energy economy. But in America, you have a kind of denial. So, is it the European West or the Anglophone Far West, the English speaking West? And it turns out, well, it's these guys that are really where the problem is located for climate change. And when you then think of like, what is in the Far West that is the root of the root of the root of the problem, then it is this kind of thinking that does not allow us to move to this new type of civilization the solution of climate change as a problem would require. We have the tools to solve the problem, but we do not solve the problem because there is no market for it. Taiwan, for example, has no solar collectors on the roofs in Kaohsiung, Tainan, Chiai, Taichung, Taipei, because there is no market for it. And the government thinks it's just too expensive. So it is easier to continue to import coal and oil from other countries. Utilitarianism and liberalism, the market and market thinking, are the root of the problem. What is the alternative then? Well, you have alternatives both in Europe and in Asia. And in Asia, the particular one that interests us is Taoism. The Taoism is a solution where utilitarianism and market liberalism is the problem. And the interesting thing for me, as a, from a philosophical point of view and from a historical point of view, is that this is not utopian thinking anymore, where we could kind of think, oh, it would be nice if people were just better. But rather, it is now the most realistic, the most pragmatic way of doing it. So if we don't do it, we will have a big problem. So, if you then think of the Taoist alternative, then one thing that you get, for example, in Tao Te Ching, in verse 10, is this idea that you already also have in the Chuangzi of moving from consumerism to a post-consumerist society. We're having stuff. It's just not so important. And like how Lydia pointed out in her talk, that it's more important to, to be in line with principles than to possess things. That is more important to, you know, to, to, to live than to live a life of property. So a being orientation, as Eric Fromm would put it, is the more enlightened way of going about it than a having orientation, which is the mode of current culture things. So the Tao Te Ching already gives us in verse 10 like ideas of how to move to like a new level. Another idea that we get in the Tao Te Ching, like in verse 25, is this notion that is absent in Western religions, namely the notion that humans are integrated in the world. Western religions, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, all think humans are very, very special and somehow are outside the world because they have that God. And God is not in nature, God is supernatural. The Tao Te Ching is more helpful for solving this problem of the climate change because it reminds us that we are already part of the world and that the way the world is follows already a way of how the cosmos is. And that, that way of the cosmos really is like the way, and that is simply natural. Now, the Shengya, the Chengwen, the, the sage in Taoist, is also this person who renounces possessions. And thus, like in verse 20, we have another uh, illustration of this ethos of climate change. Um, here you, in 77, is another verse that I think you must all be very familiar with, where you see the distinction between the Tao of Heaven and the Tao of Man. You know, the man's way and the, 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 the way of uh, uh, the cosmos. And, uh, 
Hansi Laura in the Ten the Teachings, is that also pushes for this idea that humans ought to, as it were, like, move closer to the way of the cosmos. And then here you have a nice way of contrasting this. You can basically say that the way of humans is the way of consumerism, capitalism, the carbon economy. But the way of Tian, Tian Zhe that's more as a way like the, the way of moving for post-carbon, post-consumerist, post-capitalist, being oriented. And then ultimately, you have an evolutionary vision that uh, actually I talked, some of you may remember, I talked about the last time I was here uh, as like the end point of uh, civil evolution. And in the Journal of Religious Philosophy that we got, like the issue 63 actually has to uh, I talk about this in there, so I don't need to go in there. But maybe the remarkable thing about this evolutionary vision, about like what would it mean if we move to this level, is that we get this, again to use Livia's word, authentic power by being free from tools. Think, for example, of how consumerist we are nowadays with all our laptops, cell phones, and cameras, that we almost cannot think of living without them. But that's not really evolved. The really evolved thing is just leave the laptop at home. Forget your cell phone. Don't take pictures to see. <coughs> now, here is then finally my last slide about the Wu way of geoengineering. And I just wanted to point out how I get here the verse 29 is an as of a like the uh, text in the scripture that causes a problem because it seems to suggest that Wu Wei is standing back. Wu Wei means not to interfere and that you cannot improve the universe. Now, my answer, my suggestion, my final comment about this is think of geoengineering. Think of geoengineering as not a way of aggressively, violently improving nature, but rather as bringing nature back into balance. So the geoengineer would follow the model of a physician, the model of a doctor. Climate change makes nature into a patient. And certainly, there is a Tao of medicine. And certainly, Wu Wei in medicine is compatible with the idea of a doctor helping a patient. And if that's the case, that we already have practical guidelines on how to formulate rules for geoengineering, what geoengineering we can do, and what types of geoengineering we cannot do. For example, carbon scrubbers are simply ways of the doctor to help the patient. But to put, as some geoengineers suggested, to put iron, powdered iron, into the oceans because it fertilizes the oceans and grow, uh, 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 triggers growth and blooms of plankton which then suck up the carbon dioxide is not compatible with the Tao of geoengineering because that would be to improve nature and that would co could cause runaway effects we have no control over. So ultimately then, I think the solution would be uh, to formulate a Tao of geoengineering that consists in focusing on strategies that are almost like the strategies of a doctor who wants to help a patient. And that are not intended to improve the patient, but rather to bring the patient back to the state of normal health 
that the patient enjoyed before the patient became a patient. And such strategies do exist with, for example, the carbon scrubbers and with wind and solar technology. The only problem, let me remind you, is that using these strategies costs money. That the United States, for example, has enough wind in the uh, contiguous lower 48 states and has the available technology to feed 100% of its energy needs by simply building wind farms in Oklahoma, in Texas, and in North Dakota. But it is not done because there is no profit to be made. It is more profitable to stay in the oil with give money to the oil companies. And it is not done because to do so would be to do something that's a little bit socialistic. Like for example, let's bring young people together and let's build the wind farms all together. And let's just put them in dormitories that feed them, let's feed them, but let's not pay them. That everybody does it for a better world. But there is no profit to be made. Likewise, the carbon scrubbers, is it possible to build so many to actually draw the CO2 concentrations back down to normal levels? That would be comparable to what, for example, the United States did in World War II, when it produced 100, no, it produced 2,000 ocean going liberty ships. Uh, or what the Soviet Union did in World War II when it produced 100,000 tanks. I got these numbers from Wikipedia. But nobody at this time asked, what do these 2,000 ocean ships cost? What do these 100,000 tanks cost? They just did it because it was the right thing. So now we look back at the people who fought in World War II as the greatest generation. And for us and our children to avert the climatic equivalent of World War III, and for us and our children to also be known as a great generation, requires to do something similar. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
所以今后希望我们大家一起来来研究，来这个呃怎么样这个发发扬我们这个中国的这个道家的思想啊，能够解决我们现在所面临极端的问题。好，那再一次谢谢这个彭帅哥，马上。